Okay, so um, welcome all. I'm Paolo Stellino, and I will be the moderator of this book launch dedicated to Matteo Riccardi's newly published book, Nietzsche's Philosophical Psychology, which was published by um, Oxford University Press some month ago. Uh, this book launch is part of the activities of the Lisbon Nietzsche Group, uh, which is based at the Nova Institute of Philosophy, known as Ifilnova um, Institute of Philosophy um, of the Nova University of Lisbon. The book will be presented by the author, Mattia Riccardi, and by two invited discussants, namely Claire Kerwin and Helmut Haidt. Of course, I'm uh, deeply grateful to the three of you for having accepted my invitation on the behalf of the uh, Lisbon Niche Group. Um, so let me explain to all of you uh, very briefly how the book launch will work. So um, we will begin with Mattia briefly introducing his book. Uh, so Mattia, you will have five, 10 minutes more or less. Uh, following this, Claire and Helmut will have around 15, 20 minutes to review and commentate on the book. Uh, Mattia will then answer Claire's and Helmut's questions and Afterwards, the audience, which means all of you will be invited to intervene in the uh, debate. So as long as uh, Mattia, Claire and uh, Helmut are speaking, please keep your microphones uh, muted. Um, okay, so we can start. Uh, let me introduce uh, Mattia Riccardi. Uh, Mattia received his PhD from Humboldt University, Berlin. In 2007, he held postdoctoral positions at the University of Porto and at the University of Bonn. Since 2017, he is assistant professor at the University of Porto. His two main areas of specialization are post-Kantian philosophy and philosophy of mind. He is the author of several papers in these areas, as well as of two books on Nietzsche, namely The Faule Fleck des Kantischen Kriticismus, Erscheinung und Dingen sich bei Nietzsche, published by uh, Schwabe in 2009, and uh, Nietzsche's Philosophical Psychology, the book that we are uh, presenting today. So, uh, Mattia, as I said, you have five, ten minutes to present your book. Okay, thank you. So first of all, thank you, uh, Paula and all the other people at um, Ifilnova for organizing with me. It's a great pleasure to have a, an entire event dedicated to my book and to have the opportunity to discuss it with Claire and Helmut. So I also thank, of course, Claire and Helmut for um, reading the book uh, pretty quickly. And um, I'm really looking forward to hear what they have to say about it. Um, so I don't want to take much time to uh, introduce my, my, my book. So the, the topic is Nietzsche's uh, philosophical psychology. So one could say it's Nietzsche's philosophy of, of mind. So basically his, uh, his view about how the mind in general um, works. The book has three parts. The first one um, is about Nietzsche's idea that uh, um, what it's sometimes called the human soul or what we may call human psychology is constituted uh, by drives and effects mainly. So that drives and effects are the mainly, uh, um, are the, the basic primary elements of human psychology. Uh, the most relevant also in exploratory terms. Um, so it has three, three chapters about drives, effects, and the way they interact uh, with each other. The second part of the book is about consciousness. So Nietzsche makes a famous claim according to which consciousness is just a surface. Uh, and he also say that it's uh, uh, basically superfluous. Um, uh, so these are two claims I try to uh, make sense of in this part of the book. So I, I, I argue that uh, when Nietzsche talks about consciousness, he's talking about a certain kind of consciousness, which I call reflective um, consciousness, uh, which is um, tied to uh, language. And is also tied to um, the development of, let's say, mi mind reading uh, capacities. Uh, um, then I, I, I argue that 
uh, Nietzsche allows that we are conscious also in different ways. Uh, um, uh, in, in, a, in a way that we share with our, uh, uh, let's say, non-linguistic animals, something like what people, for instance, know what they would call a uh, phenomenal consciousness. So I, I, I distinguish two other kinds of, of consciousness, in fact. But so the, the, the basic idea is that self-consciousness is one kind of consciousness we have, but we are also conscious in, in, in different way, in particular in a way which is qualitative uh, and um, something that comes close to what philosophers nowadays call uh, a phenomenal uh, consciousness, for instance. And in the in the um, in the last chapter of this part, I I, I, I uh, make sense of the claim that uh, um, consciousness is superfluousness uh, um, by offering a epiphenomenalist reading of Nietzsche. Uh, I call it weak local epiphenomenalism because it's a it's a qualified version of phenomenalism restricted in two ways. So it's explicitly only about reflective consciousness. First and second, it's a really uh, uh, so it's it, it it it's a it's about the role that uh, um, conscious so that reflective conscious state have uh, with uh, uh, in relation to the etiology of of actions. Um, the 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 last part of so that's basically uh, um, conclude the main picture of uh, 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 how I think Nietzsche conceives of the human mind of human psychology, uh, more or less in general. And then the, the, the last part is an, uh, an application of this general view to specific topics, in particular to the self. So how we can conceive of the self given this uh, picture, how self-knowledge is uh, supposed to work, um, then how the will is supposed to work. And finally, and there I leave a bit the, the uh, proper domain, let's say, of, of psychology, uh, of descriptive psychology, uh, um, the, the, so Nietzsche's notion of the ideal human type. So I think that we can make sense of it also, uh, uh, given the background of his general views about human uh, uh, psychology. So I, I, I try to say something about that that too. And um, well, the, the, I, I finish with a conclusion that's a bit tentative. In particular, there is a uh, I, I try to situate uh, a Nietzsche story within the post-Kantian tradition. And I make a very sketchy comparison with things that Kant say, and also with Hegel. Uh, so, I, so that's really very tentative, and I hope to uh, develop this. So the, those, those points maybe uh, later. But it was just to to uh, try to show that uh, Nietzsche has uh, something original to say in this, uh, and offers an interesting contribution to this uh, big post-Kantian. Uh, Tradition. So that's basically the content of, of the book. I think that's enough to uh, introduce it. Okay, um, many thanks, Mattia, um, for this great presentation of the book. Um, so let me introduce our first uh, discussant. Claire Kirwin is an assistant professor of philosophy at Clemson University in South Carolina. She works first and foremost in value theory, but her work in this area has a historical bent and she maintains serious side interest in Plato and Nietzsche. Recent publications include Pulling Oneself Up by the Hair, Understanding Nietzsche and the Freedom of the Will, published in Inquiry, and Value Realism and Idiosyncrasy, which was awarded runner up for the Mark Sanders Prize in Metaethics and is forthcoming in Oxford Studies in Metaethics. So uh, Claire, once again, you have 15, 20 minutes. Um, great, thank you so much. So I'm really uh, delighted to get to take part in this conversation. Uh, Mattia, I found the book um, incredibly rewarding and I really learned a lot from it, both about Nietzsche and his texts um, but also about uh, the philosophical issues to do with the nature of mind that are the book's um, thematic focus. And I think um, what impressed me most is that the book uh, manages to achieve what is, to my mind, the holy grail when it comes to academic work on Nietzsche, um, which is that it managed to be uh, clear and rigorous and interesting. Um, and I think managing just one of these is uh, already an achievement. Um, I think good work on Nietzsche typically manages two of them. 
Um, but one rarely sees um, all three together, I think. And so um, I think this book is a really outstanding achievement. Uh, it'll, without question, be essential reading for anyone who's trying to think about and understand Nietzsche's account of human psychology. So I hope it's clear um, how much I enjoyed the book um, and how high my regard for it is. And now I'll uh, continue to express that high regard through the philosopher's preferred love language, which is to try to pick holes in it. Um, so I wanted to uh, focus in my comments on the notion of reflective consciousness or our consciousness, as you um, call it in the book. And I'm going to start with uh, two questions that I think are primarily clarificatory questions about this notion of reflective consciousness. And then finally, I wanted to raise a worry about your claim that consciousness um, in this sense is uh, on Nietzsche's account epiphenomenal, given some of the other things that you also want to say about it. Okay, so um, what is reflective consciousness? So this kind of consciousness has several features, um, including that it is supposed to be reflexive in some sense. So it's in some sense a, a form of self-consciousness. Um, Nietzsche talks about seeing oneself in the mirror as being um, sort of a feature of this type of consciousness. And it's a way of being aware of one's mental states um, that isn't constitutive of those states themselves. And so you suggest um, that Nietzsche's account of this type of consciousness is broadly similar to familiar higher order thought theories of consciousness, uh, with the key difference being that the thing that's playing the role of the higher order thought on Nietzsche's account is specifically um, a language mediated, or um, as you sometimes emphasize, a, a verbal or verbalized interpretation of a particular um, underlying state. And so the basic Nietzschean picture, you explain this on page 81, um, is this, you have this, um, uh, this unconscious state that provides the, the text, the thing to be interpreted, um, and then a drive or drives interpret the text, and then um, what results from this is, uh, is a conscious state. Um, actually, if I understand you correctly, uh, what we end up with at the end of this process is, is really two conscious states, two states that are, are conscious. Um, and you make this clear on page 82. Uh, so first of all, the states and processes that are the target of the language mediated interpretation um, become our conscious in virtue of being targeted in this way, um, but also the language mediated interpretation itself um, is also intrinsically our conscious. So we have these two, um, these two things that are our conscious on your account. Um, so let me uh, raise a couple of clarificatory questions about, um, about this conception of our consciousness. Um, so given the definition um, of our consciousness, we can see that it's intrinsically linked to linguistic ability because it's about giving um, a verbal or language mediated interpretation of a state. So the person thinks to themselves, I feel hungry or I'm angry uh, or whatever. Okay, um, but of course there are also instances of verbal thought that don't seem to take some state of the agent as their object. Um, so the agent can also think or say um, that chair is blue or two plus two equals four or sit over there or my boss is angry. Um, and so I, uh, the first thing I was thinking was do those thoughts count as our conscious? Now, on the one hand, um, you say in several places that something's being verbalized is sufficient for it to count as our conscious. So that suggests yes. Um, but on the other hand, these kinds of statements don't appear to be reflexive. They don't appear to, um, uh, in, in particular, given your account, they don't appear to take a state of the agent as the object being interpreted. And reflexiveness was supposed to be a key feature of this kind of consciousness. Um, and so, uh, my first question is uh, what we should say about these verbal, um, these verbal states that are not obviously uh, reflexive. So you could say um, that they're not our conscious because they don't have this reflexive component. Um, if you wanted to go this way, of course, we could, they could become our conscious fairly straightforwardly um, if the agent uh, just then forms another thought that has the first thought as the object of its interpretation. Um, 
But without that, the first verbal I thought would not be our conscious fault on its own. And I, my, given a lot of things that you want to say, I'm guessing that you probably don't want to take that route. Um, so alternatively, uh, you could say that all verbalized thought is our conscious just in virtue of being verbalized, um, even if it doesn't uh, take this reflexive form. And this would mean um, dropping that feature of reflexivity from your characterization of our consciousness. So I'm guessing you maybe don't want to take that route either. Um, so the third option, which I, I suppose uh, may be the most promising, you could say the all verbalized thought is uh, implicitly reflexive, perhaps in something like uh, the way that Kant wants to say that the I think must be able to accompany all my representations or something like that. Now, of course, the story for Nietzsche, for many reasons, can't quite be Kant's story. Um, uh, and so um, perhaps we'll want to say something like this. Um, every verbalized thought comes with a sort of elliptical reference back to the agent um, or to some um, particular state of the agent. And so then um, all verbalized thought would be intrinsically our conscious in part because it always intrinsically includes an interpretation of some um, our unconscious state, um, even if that interpretive aspect is not itself made verbally explicit. I think the difficulty with taking this route is going to be in saying exactly which state is um, supposed to be the, the relevant target of the interpretation here, given that the reference to it is just left um, uh, elliptical. There are some uh, instances in which we can probably make a decent guess about which state is the relevant one. So when I think that chair is blue, um, maybe the relevant state is my perceptual state of sort of seeing it as blue or something. Um, but for other kinds of thoughts, it's less clear to me how we would pick out what the relevant state is. So um, two plus two equals four or sit over there. Um, it's just sort of less clear to me how I figure out what, what's being interpreted here. And notice that it, it won't be enough to just point to whatever state um, gives rise to the verbal uh, statement, um, because we need further the verbal statement to be an interpretation, not just a causal effect of it. And elsewhere you allow um, that interpretations can target states other than the ones that directly give rise to them. So I think that option might be the most promising, but it requires um, a further supplemental account um, of, of what's being interpreted, how we pinpoint what's being interpreted there. So that's my um, first clarificatory question here. What you want to say about instances of verbal thought that aren't explicitly um, reflexive. Um, so then my second question is about whether or not um, our consciousness is in a, in a sense that I'll try to articulate a distinctively first personal sort of state. Um, in general, it seems to me that we should want to say that consciousness of any kind, including our consciousness, is something that I can only have in relation to my own mental states. Um, now there's a sense of the word conscious in which that isn't so. So I can be conscious of your mental states where that just means I'm, I'm aware of them in some sense. But that's not the same as your mental states being conscious for me um, in the way that my own mental states can be conscious for me. We can see this difference by observing that um, if I'm not aware of your mental states, we don't thereby say they're unconscious for me, for instance. But when we look at the account um, that you offer of our consciousness in terms of this interpretation, um, this is something that I do seem able to do in relation to someone else's state, um, in relation to their affect or drive or whatever. Um, so one of the uh, non-reflexive thoughts I mentioned um, earlier was the thought, my boss is angry. Um, and presumably this uh, is an interpretation that I give in relation to my boss um, on, on the basis of some of his behaviors. But your account also allows that um, at least sometimes I do that exact same thing in relation to myself when I'm developing an interpretation. Um, I observe my behaviors and that's how I form the interpretation. Um, that's for instance, how I form an interpretation of a drive because on your account, I don't have any other sort of access um, to it. Um, but if I do that in relation to my boss's behavior, I think we'll want to say that the target of my interpretation does not thereby become our conscious, either for me or for him. Um, if I do it about my own behavior, the account says that the targeted state does thereby count as our conscious. 
But this is, um, in a way, puzzling, because why does the mere fact that the state is over here, if you like, you know, in me rather than over there in him, mean that this act of interpretation now has this special power, the power to make the targeted state conscious? Seems like the relationship I bear to my boss's state um, is just the same, ultimately, as the relationship I bear to my own state. And yet we want to say, I think, that one counts as conscious to me thereby, um, and the other doesn't. And this seems to me kind of arbitrary. Um, and so my second question is, is there any robust sense in which our consciousness is really a relationship that I can only have to my own mental life um, or not? Um, okay, finally, um, I wanted to uh, ask about the claim that our consciousness is epiphenomenal. How am I doing on time? What, what, what time did I get started at Paolo? Um, it's perfectly fine. Still have 10 minutes. Okay, great. In that case, I will, I will uh, not skip things. Okay, um, right. So I wanted to ask about uh, this claim that, that our consciousness is epiphenomenal. Um, so more specifically, uh, the position you attribute to Nietzsche, as you explained in your opening comments, is a weak local epiphenomenalism. Um, our conscious states in particular don't directly cause um, token actions. More specifically still, uh, those states that are made our conscious in virtue of being the target of a verbal interpretation are kind epiphenomenal. Here we're following um, Brian Leiter's terminology. Hi, Brian. Um, the kind epiphenomenal, uh, the state itself uh, could be causally efficacious, but if so, it won't be in virtue of its being a conscious state. Um, the consciousness doesn't add anything, if you like. Um, and then those states that are themselves the actual episodes of um, verbal interpretation and therefore intrinsically are conscious are going to be token epiphenomenal. Um, they don't themselves uh, play any direct causal role at all in relation to token actions. And I think the difficulty here um, is going to be to hold on to this form of epiphenomenalism while at the same time allowing that our consciousness has the particular social functions that you claim for it, which I'll, I'll, I'll say more about what they are in a moment. Um, so, I mean, look, on the one hand, it must be right to think that our consciousness has some sort of function for Nietzsche, right? It must do something because it wouldn't have developed at all if it didn't play some sort of role, if it didn't meet some sort of need or achieve something for us. And so anyone who wants to read Nietzsche as an epiphenomenalist about consciousness um, probably should have some story about um, why Nietzsche thinks we've ended up with it at all. And so your story um, is that it, it plays a social role. Um, in fact, uh, two kinds of social role. So first of all, is one important way uh, you suggest in which norms, including moral norms, circulate through communities. Now, um, eventually on this account, an agent who grasps a moral norm um, may come to act in accordance with it. And so we might worry, doesn't this mean that the R conscious state through which she grasped the norm is therefore causally efficacious um, uh, in relation to her actions and thus not epiphenomenal? Um, and your answer to this is uh, no, because where this happens, um, where the agent comes to act in accordance with the norm, that's only because she has also internalized uh, said norm. So the idea is the norm gets um, digested, uh, a process which is not itself a matter of conscious awareness. Um, so here the norm is kind of introduced to the agent as a sort of stimulus, but how and whether it ends up affecting her and her um, actions is going to be a matter of her drives ultimately, because those are going to determine whether, and if so, how the norm is um, absorbed by the agent and how it will then sort of end up restructuring her drives in such a way that she may or may not um, act in accordance with it. So this first story, I think is probably okay. Um, on this account, it is true that the presence of the R conscious state can end up making a difference to what the agent eventually goes on to do. Um, because, uh, so certainly given a particular R conscious input, what then happens will be a matter of the agent's drive formation. But the particular input um, plays a causal role too, right? Because given a different input, the drives would have responded differently. So um, we do have the R conscious state playing a causal role in what the agent eventually goes on to do. Um, 
But the reason that I think the story is nonetheless okay um, on your account is because its causal role is not direct. Um, it does have a causal uh, effect, but only via the intermediate stage of the drives um, sort of reshaping themselves uh, in response to uh, the input. Um, so I think the story is okay because it, it doesn't have this direct causal um, impact, but I do think it's worth acknowledging this as an illustration of the sense in which the epiphenomenalism here really is weak in a certain respect. It's a weak kind of epiphenomenalism because our consciousness can be causally efficacious in relation to token actions. It's just it can only do this indirectly, mediated by this, this process of, of the drives. So um, that's, not, that's not my worry. Uh, my worry is about the second um, social role that is attributed to our consciousness. So the second one um, is, uh, is this. The idea is that our conscious states can play the socially useful role of allowing agents to give an account of themselves, if you like, um, to say what they're doing and why to other agents. So here, the our conscious state doesn't um, causally contribute to the action, but it allows the agent to talk about the action to other agents in ways that then promote social cohesion. And the problem, as I see it, is that articulating one's reasons to someone else is itself an action. Um, and it seems plausible to think that in this sort of case, an our conscious state could play a direct causally efficacious role in relation to a particular token action. So I'm thinking of something like this. Um, I form an intention to tell my husband that I didn't finish my grading on time because I'm annoyed at my students. Um, and in forming this intention, I am at the same time, let's suppose, forming my own interpretation of my behavior. And to some extent, it will be a post hoc and falsifying interpretation. This is what we, we learned from Nietzsche. But now it seems to me this our conscious state, the intention to tell my husband that this is why I haven't finished my grading, um, this our conscious state seems to me plausibly to be causally efficacious in relation to the action that I go on to do, um, the action of telling my husband, um, you know and so on and so on. Um, and that's because here, the formation of that intention is necessary to determine the content of the action that I then go on to do. Um, it fills in the content of what I actually go on to say. I think there are ways of resisting this worry. Um, they'll likely involve a bit of a deep dive into action theory maybe, uh, particularly an account of what an intention is and how it relates to an action. Um, and it might also require uh, more detail on the, the point about um, the interpretation being not merely linguistic, but also verbal um, in some sense. Uh, but I will uh, leave it here. My third and final question then is, um, what do you think about the role of um, our conscious states and specifically those actions that are the actions of explaining ourselves to other people? Thanks. Um, many thanks, Claire. Um... Mathia, uh, do you want to answer three questions right now, or uh, should I let Helmut speak and then you answer all the questions together? What do you prefer? I think it's better if I answer this question now and then we, okay. we move on. So, so I think uh, otherwise we don't remember the questions okay. that we asked at the end. Uh, at least I, I, I'm not sure I will. Um, okay. Okay, so first of all, so Claire, many thanks for the very nice words about my work. And also many thanks for those three very uh, tough questions, I have to say. Um, um, so I start with the first two ones. So they, they, uh, um, they're really about, you know, uh, uh, um, in particular, the first two is a ways to further uh, 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 specify and develop certain uh, um, aspects of the theory, of, let's say, of the view. I, I, work out uh, and uh, attribute to, to Nietzsche, but they, they, they are really a bit uh, speculative and philosophic. So it's how, how the, the theory would, would, would work. So, we, so Nietzsche doesn't really say anything about, about that, at least in, a, in, a, in any uh, straightforward way. So, uh, I, I, so, you, you, so the, the point of re reflexivity, so the, the idea is, in fact, as you say that, uh, um, uh, um, there is some kind of reference back to the agent, uh, uh, some kind of self-description or something like that. I think um, I think there are different issues here. The the first one is is, is of of really all 
uh, um, cases in which, let's say, we, we speak or talk uh, um, are cases that we have to consider as uh, cases of conscious uh, um, of conscious states or conscious episodes of thought or something like that. So, uh, um, uh, of course, there are uh, deviant cases like talking uh, under uh, hypnosis or um, you know strange things like that. Okay, but let's say normally, uh, um, I would say that um, there is at least one 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 reason to think that they may count as as uh, a conscious. Uh, so there is this, this uh, uh, puzzling phenomenon uh, that has been observed by, by many philosophers working on, uh, on consciousness. So the, the idea that consciousness is really, in some way, easy to uh, um, understand related to language. And one, uh, so no, one, one, one point is to, to, to see that is that, you know, the, one of the criteria for consciousness is reportability. So if I can, uh, let's say, say something or describe or answer about a certain mental state. So that's a, a, a criterion to count that state as uh, um, conscious. So that's, a, so if we, if, we, if we take this idea, and I mean, what could say, so the, the, the very fact that a certain uh, um, episode of thought is linguistic, so it means that it is in a, in a, in a, in a certain way uh, uh, reportable. I mean, if you exclude the, the, the very strange cases like hypnosis or things like that, um, so they, maybe there are other um, um, cases where, uh, um, I mean, we, we, we may wonder if that's the, the, the case. So my, my, my son is now 10, 10 years old and he spent like two hours a day in some kind of um, uh, uh, inner speech about Pokemon. So is that a case of reflective consciousness? I, I mean, it's it's hard to say, but for for most of the time, I mean, if I ask him, oh, okay, what what are you thinking about? You know, he he, he can tell me. So in in that sense, I think they are probably uh, uh, conscious in this sense, at least that they. I mean, I mean one can um, report what one has been saying. But, uh, um, uh, um, if we exclude really, really strange, strange cases like like hypnosis or or, or things like that. Um, uh, um, on the other end, so uh, the the other point is: so do we always have some kind of state that we are commanding upon, so to speak? You know, every time uh, is, is is there a, a, a an unconscious state that we are targeting? And I, I think you know, in certain of the of the examples you you, you uh, presented, I. I in a, in a certain sense, you already answered the, the, the question. So the, the, the blue chair, so one could, could just say, well, in that case, I'm, I'm commanded of, on what I'm seeing of my perceptual experience. The boss could also, uh, um, I, I'm just commanding about what I, I'm, uh, I'm seeing, just seeing my, my, my boss behaving in a certain way. So it's, and I, I, I just conceptualize that in a certain way. Um, uh, you know, strangely, the, the, the only example that, that Nietzsche gives at the end of the aphorism where he, 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 where he puts forward the, 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 this idea that consciousness is a, is a comment and an interpretation of an unconscious text is something like that and say, okay, suppose I go to the marketplace and see someone laughing. So it's, it's kind of similar to, to, to the boss uh, example. So I, I, I have this kind of perceptual experience, also affective experience. Um, uh, um, I have a certain effective reaction to 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 what I see and uh, the, the 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 way I I, uh, I think about that consciously is just um, uh, um, a consequence of of that. So the the the, the case where I, where I I really uh, uh, so where I think it's hard to find a, a a target state is is really the two plus two equal four. Um, um, is very uh, but. So in all those cases, there is a web, another kind of reflexivity where we might think is involved. So in, in so, so take the, the, the chair example. Uh, I see a blue chair and I think, okay, uh, that's a blue chair. So in, it seems in, in, in that case, I have a perceptual experience and I have, but uh, you know, as long as I say, or as I think consciously uh, uh, in this way, I'll go, there is a blue chair there, I'm ascribing a belief to myself. And so maybe, uh, so, and I would say, um, 
So when we so this kind of um, ref, reference back to the to the um, to the agent in those cases to may may may, may just be the fact that I self ascribe uh, the episode as such to myself. So I wouldn't ascribe. So again, excluding very deviant cases like thought insertion or, or think like that, you know, where I, I have an episode of thought that I think that it's my neighbor who is thinking that it's not me. But, you, you know, putting aside such really uh, deviant cases. So when we have an episode of conscious thoughts, you know, we, 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 we assume that we are uh, the thinker, so to speak. So there is this sort of self-description. And that's more or less also what the high order thought theory, in fact, uh, uh, things you know, uh, a high order thought is necessarily first person, so it has this kind of uh, self description function too. Uh, sorry, last year. Okay. Um, uh, so I think that's uh, would would be the answer to your first question. So the the, the second question is about. Um, so is it really so? So what's the the difference then between uh, being conscious, let's say, of my pain or of the pain of of, of my boss or, or 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 of my neighbor. So, uh, um, uh, so you you say there is a sense in which you know this kind of self consciousness uh, uh, is about states that are here, that are mine, you know, and not uh, states uh, that are of someone else. Uh, so I, I I think here there are two two different cases, at least uh, when it comes to the way in in which Nietzsche, let's say classifies um, the main elements of, of the human mind. So uh, the, the case of pains or uh, effects or something like that, I think there are uh, um, such that usually those are, at least as I read Nietzsche, uh, uh, um, it takes those um, states to be conscious also in this kind of phenomenal way. Uh, and so I do feel pain and then, uh, uh, so I feel my pains or I feel my, uh, uh, so. I, well, my, uh, the mood I'm in or the affective state I'm in. And I, of course, I don't feel the, in, in this qualitative sense, I don't feel the pain of someone else. So I think that's simply what explains why uh, um, when I uh, uh, also consciously re reflect on those states. Uh, um, uh, um, so the, 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 the difference is already built in into this uh, feature. You know, they are phenomenal states of mind uh, the pain I am reflecting uh, on, and uh, which isn't the, the, the case in, in, in states of, of that kind uh, um, uh, that go on in, uh, in the minds of other people. Uh, um, but uh, it's true that uh, um, as far as I understand nature, the kind of um, uh, conceptual machinery, so to speak, or linguistic machinery that is activated, you know, to interpret uh, those affective states, in my case, or in the case of other people, is basically the same. Um, the difference is that in one case, you know, I'm making sense of uh, um, states I am directly experiencing, whereas on the other case, I'm not experiencing anything. So I'm just, uh, I'm a, a first personal observer of a certain kind of behavior. And so I don't have this kind of phenomenal access, let's say, to the to the to the mental state in question. Um, so when it comes to drives, however, you know, drives, I, I, as as I see, they aren't really uh, so they aren't conscious in any way. So they aren't uh, phenomenal conscious. And in in that sense, I think that there is really no difference between myself. So I discover my drive basically in the same way in which I discover drives of other people. But even there, uh, the fact that I have certain affective states that are uh, usually uh, um, associated, let's say, to, 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 to drives help me, you know, more. So take a basic case, the hunger, the, the hunger drive. I, I mean, uh, I don't feel the hunger drive, but I have, you know, this kind of pangs in my, in my, uh, uh, so the typical hunger pangs, you know, and, and that helps me, of course, to, uh, to recognize the hunger drive in myself in a way that's more reliable, so to speak, than uh, what's going on in a, in a and other people. So, so there, there's still a difference, but I, I, I don't think I am aware uh, in a phenomenal way of, of drives that they aren't the kind of thing that could be, uh, the, we, we could be aware of in that way. So I would say we are conscious 
of in a phenomenal way of uh, pains, affective states, perception, and things like that, but not of our drives. And that say, um, one could say consciousness of drives is some kind of consciousness that. So I, I am conscious that I have a drive, but it's 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 not an object that can really be the object of of, of consciousness in the in the in the other sense. Uh, um, um, okay. So I think this answer uh, the second question. I I I think I think that that, that would be my 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 answer. So the the um, epiphenomenal thing. Um, so I, I think yeah, I, 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 I agree with your um, way of putting things with uh, regard to the first um, function, let's say that uh, as, as I see it, uh, re reflective consciousness has a Nietzsche's picture. Um, um, maybe I, 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 I just add a, a something here. So I, I, I think yeah, uh, uh, this this um so we, it's a way in which a, a function is that you, you you know it it makes certain let's say social representation or norms circulate in a certain community but they usually they circulate in in the context of certain practices you know, the, the, the 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 basic function of which is to is to shape let's say uh, um our psychology as a more more basic level that is to let's say uh, um make us acquire a certain effective disposition at the end of the day so that's what i try to to show with the uh, teacher pupil example of the, the, this uh, uh, with a with a variation on on uh, wittgenstein description of of rule rule following so that uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a uh, 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 so I, 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 it was the the, the way I, I found to, to to try to to illustrate this 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 idea. So the second point, um, um, I think so. My 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 way of resisting this. So I, sh I I guess I should think a bit more about that. But so my my my, my way of resisting your uh, um, example would be to say that. Um, Uh, so the, the the thing is 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 the let, let's say the the the, the content the li, li, linguistic I I I assume the, the the example is is like is like that. So you, at some point you form this intention, and you just formulate the intention to yourself, right? Uh, um, uh, uh, and later on you 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 tell that. So it's a it's some kind of distal uh, intention. Um, so I would say um, at point T, let's say in 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 time, uh, your drive make you form the intention, you know, to to tell uh, uh, to to just to justify yourself to your um, husband, and then you you formulate you know that consciously uh, um, as a uh, as the intention to 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 say aim. Uh, to okay, I'm late with wedding or something like that. You know, if one hour later, you know, you do that with your um, husband, so you you tell him that. So I think what what makes you do that is that uh, at the so the the, the let, let let's say the drive configuration, right? That you had one hour before is still there. Okay, that you have this kind of um, uh, um, stable. Um, underlying um, configuration, let's say, at, at the level of, of your drives and effects, basically. Um, uh, of course, uh, I mean, uh, uh, you would probably then remember the, uh, uh, the way you formulated your intention before and, you know, repeat, let's say, uh, what you said before to yourself, to your to your husband, right? So I think there is there in uh, some some role you 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 know for what you said before, but it seems to me some kind of enabling um, uh, condition. Uh, the fact that you can formulate, uh, uh, so the fact that that you can basically have this kind of conscious uh, way of talking to your husband, 
uh, that you had before is some kind of enabling condition, but not really what caused you uh, at the moment to 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 tell your husband that. So it's uh, so the proximal cause of your action is uh, still lies in your drive and effects. I I would say I, that, that that's basically the the line I would take to re re resist the country. So I think something similar could be seen in the case of a promise, for instance. Suppose I I make you a promise to you and I say something. Uh, okay, what could say if you uh, two days later you you comply with the promise? Of course, you you know the, the self self conscious episode in, in which you promise some someone that you you would do uh, that uh, plays a cause of role, right? But um, I mean, I, I would say what caused you to to uh, comply with the with the promise is basically that you have acquired some kind of effective disposition to do that normally, and uh, um, in that case, no other uh, 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 the, 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 so nothing changes this drive configuration, uh, so that when the times come, you 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 come you comply with with the with the promise. So based at least the the the, the proximal causes of your complying, I, I would say, still lies in your in your um, uh, at the level of, of drives and effects. Uh, you, you you also write that that, that that some 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 other um, strategy could probably involve you, you know how intention works. You know, and making a distinction between intentions. Let's say at a self-conscious level, have intention at a uh, at the uh, um, unconscious level or something like that. Uh, uh, but I, 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 uh, so there is this uh, phenomenon. Um, so usually we conceive of intention, let's say, as basically um, propositional states or something like that that, 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 that is built uh, up from a, a, a belief desire thesis or something like that. But of course, there, uh, um, there is a gap between what we in fact do, uh, our intention. Let, let's say an intention is, is very general, but, any, uh, but an action is a, a, a particular event. So there, there are uh, 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 innumerable, innumerable ways to uh, uh, act in a way that is uh, um, a realization of, less, uh, of a conscious intention uh, so if I if I have the intention to open the door, there are many ways in which I can do that, and uh, um, the 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 content open the, the door can uh, be uh, what really guides my specific way of opening the door because that is really much more specific than the the uh, abstract description at uh, at the propositional level. So maybe there you you could uh, also uh, um, so starting with with this general. Uh, observation about the relation between you know general intention and particular action, uh, which is a point that I think Nietzsche really uh, appreciate. So, uh, and starting from them, you could also um, work so as to um, uh, um, let's say avoid this sort of counterexample. But I, th I think I think I, sh I should think a bit more about that. So it's a it's a it's a it's a tough question. Thank you very much. Yeah. Many thanks, Matteo, for this very complete answer. Um, Claire, if you uh, want to add something, maybe you can do this later during the debate. OK, um, so let me introduce our second discussant. Uh, Helmut Haidt is director, director of the Kolleg Friedrich Nietzsche of the Classic Stiftung Weimar and honorary professor of philosophy at the Technische Universität Berlin. Before coming to Weimar, he was associate professor at Tonji University in Shanghai. He works in the fields of philosophy of culture, philosophy of science, critical theory, social philosophy, and European ident identity and values. Helmut Haidt is co-editor of Nietzsche Studien and of the book series Monographien und Texte der Nietzsche Forschung, published by the Goiter, and member of the executive board of the German Nietzsche Gesellschaft. Among his several publications are the volumes Nietzsche as a Scholar of Antiquity, edited together with Anthony Jensen and published by Bloomsbury in 2014, and the handbook Nietzsche und die Wissenschaften, edited with Lisa Heller de Goethe 
2014. So, uh, Helmut, you have up to 20 minutes. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me on this uh, virtual panel here. Um, I anticipate that I should or may probably represent the more continental, <laughs> even though I'm, I'm not sure whether this is an, an adjective I would like to go for. Um, but to some degree, I will probably um, open up some some other and, and, and probably broader or less microanalytic questions as compared to those we just discussed, um, which I, I think are, are very helpful, uh, in particular the relation between general intentions and particular actions is something we may uh, draw back on later in the discussion, because I'd like to, to focus on, on a few other issues. Um, First, I would like to mention that I um, that I struggle a little reviewing this book because I like it so much, um, and that is to some degree a disadvantage if you wish to um, give a productive feedback. And um, in the being in the position of liking uh, or appreciating the work of Mattia reminded me that actually my first publication in Nietzsche Studien in 2010 was a book review um, on Nietzsche's, uh, sorry, not Nietzsche in this case, Matthias um, PhD. And, and even back then, I appreciated very much his ambition to um, connect historical consciousness and um, a very broad um, understanding of, of contemporary texts Nietzsche engaged with and relate them to a reconstructive discussion with contemporary significance to the, the philosophical field he was dealing with. And um, having this book in mind um, and other of his studies, I, I was actually, Mattia, I was actually a little disappointed to see from my point of view a little too less contextualized explications of how Nietzsche's views probably emerged within this context and what issues he may address or may not address because my my feeling is to to um to look forward to to what i try to say in a little more detail later is that probably um even though nietzsche is inspiring in many ways he may probably not really in in the position to contribute something significant to the questions you just discussed with Claire, for example. And um, I, I think it wasn't overly surprising that while you were discussing these issues, the name Nietzsche and quotations from Nietzsche so didn't play a major role in them, rather than how does epiphenomenalism or a weak local epiphenomenalism um, solves particular problems in the contemporary philosophy of mind. And so this doesn't mean to, to question the project in general, but I think that it points to an issue which um, you expl explicitly address also, Matthias, in the starting, in the, in the preface of your book. I, I think um, you succeed very, very, um, um, very in a very inspiring and, and exemplary way in what I would like to call a tightrope walking um, procedure between um, a constructive or reconstructive um, approach towards Nietzsche, trying to relate him cont to contemporary debates in, in contemporary philosophy. And on the other hand, um, trying to reconstruct it's interesting to see that these both are kinds of reconstruction, um, reconstruct Nietzsche's relation to his contemporary um, intellectual framework. And this version of historical consciousness you display um, becomes very um, inspiring here and also very um, successful, at least in most cases. And I think um, you generally succeed to um, avoid what you call an anachronistic monstrosity. So this is not the case. Nonetheless, at some points, I, I felt like um, 
probably it would help to look with some more detail into Nietzsche's readings. Um, actually, what you did to wear in a way more, uh, to much larger degree in your 2007 book, probably you were just fed up with this stuff and wanted to, to engage with another discourse universe and with other people who, who don't care that much about these historical stuff, and, which is fine with me. Um, but, okay, so if you approach a book which you like and you don't know exactly how to, how to deal with it and, and how to come up with some problems, um, it's always uh, one of the easiest things is starting with methodological issues. And um, in particular, if you basically agree with most of the, of the content and the outcome of the argument. So go for methods. And with respect to the methodological um, issues, I do have actually a number of, I'd say, minor questions or issues. Um, in your, in your preface, you state that you're going to focus on um, the late Nietzsche, 1886 to 1888, um, um, employing what you call a partially developmental um, concept or approach. Um, partially, partially, I believe, in order to, uh, to mark some distance from, let's say, Maud and her approach to Nietzsche. But you still, I think, uh, avoid the question whether you are um, whether you approach Nietzsche as somebody who is himself developing in a way that his latest works are mature, where these earlier works are premature or not not yet the real Nietzsche or something like like that. And um, rather than I mean, another way would just be I choose to engage with this later material because I think this is most inspiring with respect to what I'm trying to address. Um, so you don't necessarily need to imply that we have this intellectual evolution in Nietzsche and, and the books in 86 and 7 are mature and then probably there's a decline coming and now he's getting mad already. So um, we don't want to include uh, those. Um, okay, so th this is more like a, a question: How, what this partially means in your in your approach? I also liked, and, and in fact, during the reading your study, I didn't really see that you would restrict your your arguments mainly, or I mean, mainly you do, but you also refer to to other pieces in Nietzsche's work, which refers or, and also relates to what I like about uh, your engagement with the Nachlass. The way you treat the Nachlass is, um, I believe, very productive in that way that you say the Nachlass helps us understanding how Nietzsche came about with his particular views and how he experimented with them, tested them, changed them and transformed them. So his reading notes are important to see and, and they are also helpful if you relate them to who, what he actually made out of them, how he um, uh, refined and polished a particular idea for, for the published work and how those relate to his um, earlier sketches and stuff like that. So this doesn't attribute any, uh, no, of course, not any... Um, superior significance to the Nachlass and it also avoids um, misleading approaches like reconstructing Nietzsche's metaphysics out of his unpublished notes which doesn't lead you anywhere but uh, the way you treat Nietzsche's Nachlass I think really serves a particular purpose within this project and, and, and um, I, I appreciate this very much, in particular because it also helps you to avoid something like patchwork Nietzsche. So just taking bits and pieces uh, from wherever uh, you, you, uh, Nietzsche's source helps you to find um, related passages and then form an, uh, a theory about them. So this is what I think is, is really um, very helpful because it also helps to contextualize Nietzsche 
in front of his particular intellectual background. And um, I don't mean doing that um, would necessarily imply dating him into the 19th century and transforming him, him into a historical figure which should be treated by historians rather by philosophers with particular interests in particular topics. But uh, the way Nietzsche would, uh, I mean, if you want to, my impression is, is with respect to Nietzsche's philosophical psychology and the, the, the questions we are addressing today, much more refined questions, I'd say, as Nietzsche is doing in the 19th century, um, relating Nietzsche to these questions is also, I believe, helpful in order to see how um, we probably focused our um, philosophical rigor on issues which are peculiar, probably, from a Nietzschean perspective. Because, um, so my impression, it's, it's not by, by incidence uh, that Nietzsche would not talk about, uh, well, should I buy an ice cream or not? or um, is this chair blue or not? Um, the way he talks about um, the, the function of drives and how, how drives are the basis for a particular surface, um, I think um, approaches um, or um, aims at something different. Okay, so I, I'm gonna come back to this one, because first I'd like to to give um, a brief overview, probably, of, of what I think what you did. I mean, the three parts of your book, um, they're actually, that's a great idea, doing it like this. And uh, and I, I'd really like to, to point that out. Probably not everybody in the, in the audience um, uh, read it. Um, but, or had a chance to, to read it so far, but I mean, in the first in the first part, you set out what is what does Nietzsche mean with drives and affects. Actually, I was particularly uh, impressed by by your ambition to um, have a chapter on drives and another one on affects. I'm not sure if if uh, in particular affects and the conclusion of affects illustrates that. I believe the the notion of affects is even less well-defined or coherent or clear within Nietzsche's philosophy. And my impression is uh, this is also true with respect to drives. Uh, he uses the word in so many different and also often metaphorical uh, forms that I think when as far as you can get with respect to a somewhat clear working definitions of these concepts, you, you, you got very far. And I, I was also very positive um, by um, the last, the fourth chapter of the, the, so the last chapter of the first part, and because it addresses what I think is is probably most important to Nietzsche, because he he doesn't, my impression is at least, that he doesn't have so much a theory of drives, in particular particular or individual drives because he's probably more interested in the order of rank among drives or a certain organization of drives and effects and how they form a certain composite. And um, this is, I believe, very important. And you point to that when you, when you talk about the sociality and the socialization of um, these drives. And I would like to, to hear a little more about those um, connections. Um, I, I don't want to say much about um, the second part. Uh, we discuss this um, epiphenomenalist view a lot. Um, there's certainly anachronism involved, uh, um, uh, trying to explicate Nietzsche with a word like that, but nonetheless, I think it's, it's very helpful. I, I have um, learned a lot and I fully agree, uh, unless somebody explains me how this is not convincing. <laughs> about your uh, ideas regarding reflective consciousness and also that there is a pluralism involved. So this is all, uh, all fine with me. Also, uh, most of what you do in the third part of the book, even though I was a little disappointed, actually, from my point of view, the most interesting, uh, but this is 
is uh, relates to my philosophical taste recently probably i was most excited about your chapter 11 where you leaving descriptive psychology and um, go into the more um, into the more fishy domains of um, of um, the idea of what a good psychological type may look like from a Nietzschean perspective. So where you um, enter the terrain, I believe, um, which was in the focus of Nietzsche's interests rather than um, this theory of drives and surface and stuff like that. Um, anyhow, um, to those who are interested in the debate on naturalism, I should probably mention that even though this Quarrel or this topic underlies um, most of the discussion in the book. Um, it is, at least as far as I, I saw it, um, most straightforwardly addressed in chapter 12. And um, so I would like to recommend that if you wish to deal with uh, these things a little more. Okay, so let me come to um, to one issue I pointed to already occasionally um, and where I think that um, it would be interesting to to dig a little deeper, which is basically the connection between the semiotic claim and the dependence claim. So these are, as far as I, I see, not so much connected in your book, and I, I wonder how you see the relation between those. With respect to the semiotic claim, um, which is, as far as I understood it, basically refers to the idea that um, our drives and uh, effects are um, fundamental and that they show, reveal themselves in a particular Zeichensprache. Also, this is a Zeichensprache der Triebe und Affekte. It's a it's a sign language or an expression, a semiotic expression of um, underlying drives and effects. And um, when you introduce this idea at the very beginning of your book, chapter one, page 11, um, you, you um, and this is where I was a little disappointed, actually, you, you say, yeah, this may sound weird at the first glance, but... Um, if you if you look into the context, um, like Wilhelm Wundt and Wilhelm Diltai, uh, you see it's not so un uncommon, actually. Thus, the claim on which Nietzsche's philosophical psychology is based looks less outlandish once we factor in its historical context. And, um, I mean, you go further, but, I mean, I mean Diltai and Wundt are not really... A clear case of Nietzsche's intellectual context, because uh, I mean Wilhelm Wundt read Nietzsche. He actually wrote a review um, or mentioned Nietzsche in an article uh, of Mind, but Nietzsche didn't engage that much with Wilhelm Wundt. Neither did he with Diltai, and um, he rather engaged with those figures you mentioned afterwards, like um, Schopenhauer and Paul Rehe, and in particular, um, of course, Georg Heinrich Schneider. Der tierische Wille. And what you do with them is very helpful, also with Meyer. But I, I thought, okay, in this case, it would be interesting, on the one hand, uh, in particular with respect to the semiotic claim, to go back to some degree, as you actually did in your, in your PhD, to a truth and lie in an extra moral sense, and um, the way Nietzsche um, revises and reworks in an engagement with Gustav Gerber and the physiology of Hermann von Helmholtz uh, and combines them in a semiotic physiological concept of how we um, we produce or construct uh, an interpretation of the world by a combination of semiotic science and physiological interaction and um, unconscious um, um, conclusions. So this would be, I, I wonder what you think about that and why you didn't um, include, or, or I may have um, overlooked that into your argument here. Um, it relates to, to one other figure I was missing, um, 
which is um, Wilhelm Ruh, um, Der Kampf der Teile im Organismus. So Wilhelm Ruh, The Struggle of the Parts Within an Organism. And um, because this is, this is a, a, a text um, well known that Nietzsche read it and blah, blah, blah. Salakwada wrote on that and Müller Lauter, many people. So there's nothing new about it. And you wrote about it as well. But when it comes to, to tackle this um, idea of a Rangordnung, an order of rank of drives and effects and how they form an organization, um, I, I thought it would at least be worthwhile engaging with these ideas, in particular since you discuss the, the problem of the homuncular view. And um, there are, of course, a number of passages, um, in particular, for example, Beyond Good and Evil 6, um, which pretty much appear to or look like um, drives as small demons or kobolds, which is actually the, the words, in, as a daemon is uh, the word Nietzsche uses, uh, making a reference to Socrates, most likely. Um, so we have these um, this problem that the different drives and effects interact with one another. They form an organization, a composition. They're, they are struggling, apparently. There, there is, um, there is uh, um, to be short, there is something going on between them, among them, on the sphere of uh, drives and effects. And um, this, I believe, is, is um, you address that, um, but I'd like to, to hear a little more on that, and in particular, why you um, uh, didn't discuss uh, Wilhelm Ruh within this context, because um, I think this also helps um, to address the question of dependency, because if you, if you think of the underlying um, um, basic level, briefly said, as if you think of this level as something which is in itself um, not non-causal, but causal in a complex way, like a, a, a constant process of, of interaction, interchange, um, and, and struggling, then of course the outcome on, on the surface may be different in different conditions or depending on, on how this particular um, underlying structure transforms under certain conditions. And I, I, my impression is, I didn't work that out to, to any systematicity, but my impression is that the assumption that we have um, that we have something like a process ontology on the basis rather than a, a, a more or less fixed set of drives and effects and then they um, display causal um, efficiency. Um, if you if you rather uh, go for something like a, a process of interacting and change and transformation, um, it's also easier to to um, to explain how Nietzsche would argue for a dependency, but not for a determinacy, and how he would. Um, I mean, to be short, to, to how he would have space for all this perfectionism. Um, individual ev um, um, involvement and refinement ideas, uh, this whole evaluative or normative project of um, becoming who you are in a way that um, includes perfectionism or self-overcoming and stuff like that. Okay, so this is probably... No, I, I, I would probably close with, um, with a quotation. There is somebody who, who, who wrote that... Um, at the end of the day, I, it's my translation because this book was originally in German. Um, the, at the end of the day, uh, reality, uh, we should understand reality as an unstopping, um, ever-changing process of interactions of uh, power quantities or quanta. Um, and this um, um, points to an alternative uh, to, a, to an interpretation of the world, alternative to the concepts of causal mechanics, which is um, 
Mattia Riccardi, of course, 2007. Thank hey, you. Uh, many thanks, Helmut. Um, Mattia. Okay, thank you, Helmut, for, uh, first of all, for your uh, nice words again on my book. Thank you also for this final uh, quotation. I didn't recognize it, actually. Uh, yeah, I, um, I mean, yeah. it was a very poor... Uh, yeah. but I, 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 not, I, I wouldn't necessarily, um, you know, I, I um, so far, I, though I think there are problems in my in my first book, so I, I would reject everything, and I'm and I and I'm, and I'm not sure I would reject this 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 part. But um, it's true that I didn't really uh, uh, talk about those issues and uh, and this other uh, book. Uh, um, so I, I, I so you really raised many points. I tried to address them, uh, and then uh, you know in the end, if I forget something, please please uh, please tell me. So I, I start with the more uh, methodological uh, issues. Um, so first of all, uh, okay, you're you're right that you know Claire and I didn't really talk about Nietzsche. We talk about certain um, uh, consequences, you know, that the, the view I work out may may have, you know, how to fill in certain gaps. So I I, I say uh, that uh, um, the. Uh, this specific issue is is something that you have to reconstruct. You know, Nietzsche doesn't provide a a, a, a theory of human psychology. In particular, he is more interested, as you uh, also point out, in issues that has to do with morality. But he says many things that. So I, I think as long as he gets interested in morality and more of psychology, he starts to get interested in uh, human psychology in general. And I think he has interesting things to say there. So that's why I I, I thought it's worth exploring them and even try to uh, um, put them together into some kind of, uh, uh, um, uh, um, let's say, global picture, which is not, in fact, what we uh, uh, find, let's say, on the face of, of, of Nietzsche's um, text. Um, uh, so the, the, nonetheless, I try to show that certain issues, at least, are, uh, um, uh, are, are things, you know, that Nietzsche uh, 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 work out by engaging with certain um, authors. You're right that I didn't really make a, a, a comprehensive um, study or investigation, you know, of let's say what German called the sources, right? Beca I, 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 I did a selective thing. So I, I, I only considered those that were really relevant or help to, uh, uh, um, to, Eliminate, you know, the things I I I I I wanted to explain. Um, that's also why. So um, you, you, you're probably right that it that it could have included, uh, for instance, people like Willem Brou, uh, Rolf, or something like that. So but, but, but the reason I didn't do it is that my impression is that um, Nietzsche, uh, uh, for instance, in Beyond Good and Evil, he really starts presenting the drives as psychological things. And he, he really uh, talks a lot about psychologists, not really about biology. So uh, in the in the Nachlas, you really find much more biological talk, but it doesn't really translate so much into uh, uh, Beyond Good and Evil. Um, and that's the, the reason why I, I, I focus more on uh, um, also on the sources that are really more psychological, like Schneider or Ribot later in the book. Um, or Epina. Um, uh, uh, also, I think these authors are less studied than Rue, for instance. So uh, I'm, I'm, of course, not the first one to um, investigate Schneider and Ribot and um, Epina. But I think it's uh, 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 so the work I am aware of is not really systematic. So you find them. Uh, um, quoted here and there. So, for instance, uh, Maria Cristina Fornari in, in, in her book about Spencer and Nietzsche, she talks about, uh, I guess, all three. I'm, I'm not sure she, she talks about Ribot, but I'm sure she, she, she talks about Schneider and she talks about um, Epina. But it's, it's, it's not the, the, but, but, but it's not the focus of her book. I mean, it's, it's, and, and there is no, let's say, paper about them as you have about, um, Rue and Nietzsche or something like that. So I thought it was also uh, maybe more interesting to, to, to look into that. And surely uh, closer to the point, at least to, to, to so I, I, I think Schneider is really a direct um, 
impulse to the notion of drive uh, as Nietzsche works it out uh, um, and so on. Uh, so, but I, 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 at the very beginning, I also wanted to situate Nietzsche in a more broader uh, um, uh, 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 scenario. So that's why I talk about Wund and uh, about um, Dilte. So Dilte is also interesting because he draws himself basically on Schneider too. So it shows how Schneider in fact was important back then. So William James uh, uh, um, still considering also a uh, uh, authority basically in, in the principles of psycho. So the, the idea was to try to situate in, in, in this broad context, but, but also in, included some of the major psychologists of, of the time, in, 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 in particular James and, and Vuhlen. But I, I, it's true that they don't, don't, don't play any uh, um, particular role. So about the developmental thing. So uh, something that I found uh, somewhat interesting is that some of the claims that really are um, related with Nietzsche's um, drive psychology as it's presented in um, Beyond Good and Evil, for instance, we found them late in the Nachlas of 1880, like uh, the semiotic claim, the first formulation we find them, and a couple of others' uh, ideas too, that uh, uh, he will uh, really publish, so to speak, a couple of years later in Beyond Good and Evil with, with uh, um, uh, different formulations. Um, uh, so that made me think that maybe, you know, he had this kind of insights back then, and uh, um, he... Mathieu, you've Mathieu. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. sorry. Okay. I don't know what, what happened. Uh, um, so the, I got the impression that he had the, the, this insight basically uh, uh, already there, but he, 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 it will take him some time, you know, to really uh, uh, work them out. So that's, for, for instance, the semiotic claim is really published in, in the under Um So uh, the development is just, so I, I didn't want to imply that the early Nietzsche is not worth or, or something like that. But so my point is uh, Nietzsche's philosophical psychology. And that's really something that we find in the, in the later work in particular, uh, let, let's say starting, but already from daybreak. And I think there is this kind of development we find already at that time and the Nachlas and some, and some things also in, in daybreak, certain theses, certain claims uh, but uh, it will have um, more ingredients. So uh, the development, and I think he, he also changed certain certain uh, aspect of his of his spot and certain ideas in particular. Um, that's my claim. So the, what's the role of consciousness? And then uh, also the epiphenomenalist claim. They come uh, um, later. Uh, so I think there is a partial development in the sense that some, so you have certain ideas already, let's say in the early 80s, and that's a starting point. And some of those ideas, Nietzsche keeps them like the semiotic claim, but certain ingredients are added, you know, with the time, as long as he um, develops his, his views about human psychology and certain claims are really added later on. So the, the, there is a partial development in the sense that something changes, something are added and something uh, and, and some other things remain the same. So um, it's just then what I, what I, what I wanted to, to say. Uh, uh, okay. Um, right, I, I, I think that you're, um, so I, 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 I understand that you find the, the last chapter in, in some sense more interesting, you know, because the, the, you, 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 as you say, you know, I leave uh, uh, um, the, 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 the descriptive psychology, so to speak, and I go and I move on to more beefy stuff like, you know, uh, values and how uh, the great human being should work and so on. So that, that's also why I, I, I really wanted to have a chapter like that at the end, you know, to, to, but it was also to, uh, you know, yeah. there is this, um, uh, um, so Sebastian Gardner uh, has read a, 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 a paper which I, I, I like very much, where he said, "Well, you know, all this kind of normative uh, stuff in Nietzsche you, you, it requires, you know, a more um, uh, 
some kind of neo Kantian or something like that, um, uh, um, uh, um, or post Kantian really uh, strong uh, um, conceptual framework. So, so if mm -hmm. you so the, the the minimalist Nietzsche, the destructive Nietzsche that really wants to uh, so that the hyper naturalist Nietzsche so doesn't have the uh, enough uh, resources, you know, then to project uh, uh, a normative picture as uh, he in fact does. So, and he mm -hmm. sees there is, and he, he argues there is this kind of, of gap or tension in it in his project. So on the one hand, he wants to reduce everything to pure nature, so to speak, but on the other hand, he wants to pro project an idea, you know, and the, and the two things clash. So what I wanted to show is that in, in fact, his descriptive psychology uh, gives him enough resources to make sense of um, mm. the idea that certain human beings are uh, for, 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 from an evaluative uh, um, point of view, let's say more, uh, like something like healthier or stronger or whatever, mm. right? Uh, so I, I, I think it was an important, um, so I, it was for me important to, to, to uh, um, finish with a chapter like that. So uh, um, I, I, I could have, uh, expanded a bit more and, and included and include more issues, um, mm. but but I'm I think I'm, I'm in fact I'm I am I'm happy that it's also not too uh, too big or 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 uh, that it just uh, um, stays um, on the other end pretty close to the uh, rest of the book. So it's not really something completely uh, um, unrelated to to the rest. Um, so about naturalism. So I, I, again, it's it's not really a uh, uh, a topic of of the of the book. So I, I assume that uh, uh, Nietzsche is naturalist in some sense or other, and in a in a in a in a strong sense of the term. So that's why I, I yeah. contrast it at the end with Hegel. So, you know, you know, people now uh, some people say that Hegel is naturalist. So I, I mean, we can define naturalism in a way that uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That Hegel is a naturalist. Maybe that Barclay is a, a, a I don't know if Peter. Would agree they're with only that. naturalists but, you know but uh, is a is a kind of aristotelian second nature naturalism so the way you you would nowadays call mcdowell a naturalist uh, right uh, the uh, hegelian naturalism uh, so it's not really uh, the kind of naturalism that nietzsche uh, uh, endorses or we, we we may discuss about the details you, you know what 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 exactly uh, um, uh, nietzsche means with naturalism but it it, it wouldn't be the same kind of naturalism you would ascribe to Hegel anyway, I think, at least, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, so that's why I mentioned at the end, uh, really that, just to, to, to make the, the, the contrast be with, um, with Hegel, basically. See. So the, 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 uh, so the, um, so the uh, another point, you know, is the relation between the semiotic claim and the, um, Dependency claim. So you 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 read it. I I I there is a a, a a link there, and it's probably the case, but I don't really uh, uh, make it explicit. So um uh, so the semiotic claim is, as you said, you know, the claim that uh, uh, as Nietzsche states in in Beyond Good and Evil, morality is uh, a, a sign language of uh, um, drives and effects. So sometimes you use the uh, in certain certain formulation we find the drive, in in other we find the effect. Um, and the dependence claim is we, uh, so that's a, um, I claim I, so it's, it's, it's not, it's not something that, that, that it's a, it, it doesn't really correspond to, to a Nietzschean claim, but it's basically the idea that we find in Zaratustra, you know, that the Zelbst and the Ich um, mm -hmm. uh, are, are in a relation such that the Ich is made by the self, so it's constituted, uh, is constituted yeah. by the, the, the self. So my, my, my uh, reading of that is the, the, the self-conscious self is just a, an, Upshot, let's say, of of the the of the, the, the zapst as, as as constituted by by our drives and affecting this kind of hierarchic uh, arrangement. Um, yeah. And so I would say uh, uh, um, uh, uh, one of the things that uh, um, as conscious, um, so the evaluative perspective, including the moral perspective of the self-conscious self, is just an upshot of. Um, the value of, of, of the, the structure of the, of the, of the drive. So uh, in that sense, uh, morality is a sign language of 
uh, drives an uh, effect just be because our moral viewpoint is just based on or depends on the kind of drives and effects we have and the kind of com configuration they um, they have. So 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 that, that's basically the relation. So I think the semiotic claim is just an example of the way in which Z and ich are um, related. So uh, um, so I think you, this this so I think this passage from Zarathustra, you know, very famous, is is a, is a mm -hmm. is very important there's a letter where, where uh, I, I think it's to, to, to his editor where, where Nietzsche said you know that beyond good and evil is just a uh, just makes exactly the same claims that Zarathustra makes but with a different language so I think that uh, uh, some of the things that Nietzsche says about human psychology and beyond good and evil are just uh, um, a way of spelling out you know what what we found in this famous speech of Zarathustra about the, the despises of the body I think the relation between SEPs and H, I think it's really uh, important to, to make to make sense of this basic idea of human psychology of the relation between the unconscious drives and effect and the conscious self, so to speak. Okay, I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't know if I mentioned Yeah, I'm absolutely thing. happy. I'm absolutely, yeah. May I say that I'd, I'd like to have one, two very words. Briefly. Okay, yes. very briefly. So. The one thing I, I didn't mean to push you into um, some ideal of um, reconstructing the complete background of Nietzsche's reading. So I, I think you did perfectly well in this regard. One could have included a few more. The, the only thing is, um, what I'm really interested in is the relation between um, the surface and the underlying structures and this is how i see the connection between the semiotic claim and the, the dependence claim so the semiotic claim also refers to the idea that there that there is a language sign structure on the surface and and there's something which it refers to which is underlying and i wonder how you see this relation i, I really wonder is it yeah. like a causal connection or is it rather this is why i brought up this idea with, yeah. with william Wu and so is it rather a, a concept of wechselwirkung mm -hmm. where where you have this interaction as well on the on on the level of the surface uh, on or between the surface and the the basis and also in the basis itself so and i'm, I'm really curious what do what yeah. do you think about this idea of wechselwirkung Okay, I, I, so my, my way of, of understanding is, 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 is that between this two, two level, there is not really a uh, vaccine vehicle, much rather that the, the, the one is more, uh, um, is let's say, uh, um, so it's as a, or, it's or, as a or, metric. Or, oh. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if it's causal or not, it's difficult to, to see, you, you, mm -hmm. you know, Zeichen can be, uh, uh, understood in different. So sometimes Nietzsche talks about symptoms, which is more uh, a, a causal uh, uh, metaphor. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, uh, so maybe uh, a constitutive uh, um, relation would also go. Oh, okay, someone could also uh, uh, use here the notion maybe of supervenience, and I'll say that the mm -hmm. the, the, the conscious of supervenes on, on drives and effect would be a weaker relation than than. than or more general re relation, let's say that, than causation. I, I leave it open. I, 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 I think, but, but, but uh, at the end of the day, but, but I think it's asymmetric. Yeah. Um, okay. Many thanks, Mattia. Um, so, if you are not too tired, maybe we can have um, fifteen minutes debate. Is that okay for you, Mattia? Yeah. Sure. Oh, yeah. Okay. So do we have... I mean, as long as I talk here, I don't have to go prepare dinner, so I'm fine. Great. So I see a lot of friends, colleagues from all over the world. So um, any question? Please don't be shy.
Benedetta, you have a Yes, actually, I have a question. Um, so, Mattia, first of all, congratulations for this groundbreaking work. Uh, um, I really uh, liked it. Um, I, I, I could uh, ask you thousands of questions, but I, I I'd like to focus just on one point that is uh, uh, directly involved in my field of study. Uh, specifically, I would like to uh, say you some more words uh, about the relationship between uh, words uh, and concepts. Because if I understood correct from the concept Benedetta, so Benedetta we were concepts independent which what so on truth on lies and so on but it is very clear that Nietzsche understands the meaning of words in a way so directly connected to language sorry any problem we well, lost you for for yeah. A, yeah for a while. Um, okay. But I think the question is is kind of clear. So I, so I think if you go on, I guess I understand it, um, everything you said. Now it's basically so you um, stated in the book that from the eighties onwards Nietzsche progress progressively detached the concepts and words. So I would like to ask you why um, he so you mentioned two readings uh, um, Lippmann and uh, uh, Helmholtz uh, but Nietzsche knew Helmholtz already in his Basel years uh, so it can, can make the difference okay thank you so it's it's uh, it's um, it's so I, first of all uh, um, um, so I, I think that you you you, uh, um, you so you can see that he moves um, from the idea that uh, concepts are uh, world dependent from the idea that they are not. So I think, it, uh, so, in, so first of all, so they, they are really two different philosophical uh, conception what concepts are. And I, I think that the, the, the first one that, that concept is more uh, um, sort of that to have a concept you have to uh, uh, master the corresponding word, so it's it's probably more common among philosophers, and uh, uh, um, uh, the other one is probably more common among uh, uh, psych psychologists, or is something that is maybe more related to the to the uh, in person tradition, I guess. I guess. Uh, um, but I I think there are pros and cons for for both. Uh, um, feel feel philosophical position. Now, I, I as you said, you know the the. the uh, uh, so maybe uh, the early Nietzsche, you know, um, was very much influenced about GABA. Uh, um, uh, you see that in his follies of, uh, about um, rhetorics. And you see this uh, directly, you know, in the necklace of that period and, and in truth and life. Um, uh, I, I, uh, uh, but in the in the Nachlas, I eighty four eighty five or something like that. You you know you, you know you have a couple of notes that seems to move away from this and and um, end up with what he then published in in uh, uh, Beyond Good and Ill, where some of the concept of this, this kind of uh, uh, um, build session, right, which mm -hmm. su su suggests some some kind of pictorial or imagistic representation that is not and 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 is not no, no longer dependent on language okay it's just something that he says very I'm, I'm it's we don't have also a lot of textual basis so um why why did he um get this idea really i i i'm i don't i don't know so i one uh, speculation i have is that maybe teichmuller in fact so if we if we look at sources i i remember uh, 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 uh passages where uh, um uh, um, very close from from Teichmüller, where you have a bit this idea um, uh, uh, of concept as some kind of image, but, but but I should I should I should really check it. I, I'm not I'm no longer sure. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in fact, uh, so I can I, I I can check it and and and, and then if if there's something great I can okay. send it to you. Okay, thank you. Um, so of, of 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 course you know. Great. Uh, yeah. Uh, so Helmut and and. Um, uh, uh, um, had this idea, you know, that were unconscious inferences. Um, 
and of course, Nietzsche knew yes. that already uh, early on. So maybe you know he appreciated more of the idea later. You know that if you have unconscious inferences, um, maybe concepts are not dependent on language. I don't. I don't know. Uh, um, in particular, I mean, if he if he if he says that uh, uh, language dependent thought is conscious, and if you say that you have unconscious inferences, I mean, inferences seem to imply some kind of notion of concept or other. Uh, uh, so if uh, and and if they are in, if they are unconscious, if this language is is a, is a, uh, goes together with consciousness, then you, you need to have some kind of concept that don't depend on language. So maybe that that's the idea. I I, I but it's but it's hard to 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 to, to say why why he switches let's say from a from one one conception to to a, to another. At least I, I didn't find any specific I can hear I, you. I, I, I'm sorry. Okay. I searched for for this build session to see if if some if some if, some, if something pops up from other authors but but I didn't find find anything. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, thanks, um, Tom. Yeah, hey, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Yeah, so thanks. I, I really enjoyed the, uh, the talk and the discussion. I, I just have a couple of questions. I, I'm sure that you actually answer them in the book in the third part, but um, so I'm interested, first of all, in just self-knowledge and what Nietzsche has to say and what kind of implications you have of this. But one of the sort of interesting things is just that, so you suggest that the soul or the self is constituted by drives and affects, but the drives are unconscious. And so it seems that self-knowledge now becomes something that's very much indirect. So when we're conscious of ourselves and their self-consciousness, it's it always seems very, very partial. I mean, if, if affects partly constitute the self and they have some sort of phenomenal uh, expression that's accessible to us, then, yeah, we're only seeing shades of ourselves at best, but never really getting deep down into who or what we are, except indirectly. And that seems to suggest that self-knowledge is indirect in the same way that it's very much indirect in relation to anyone else. Um, and so I'm wondering if there's any kind of, um, yeah, so I mean, in what way is the self-knowledge change for Nietzsche from a sort of traditional understanding that we have, which is very much tied to consciousness and whether there's still something unique about self-knowledge that a lot of philosophers want to maintain, or is it just entirely now dependent on something like phenomenal consciousness? Um, so does Nietzsche enable us to salvage anything of that? Okay, thank you for the, the question. So I, I think, yeah, you, 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 so the, the kind of, uh, um, um, claimed, you know, you 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 um, derived, you know, from what I said, are, are basically accurate. Um, so that's more or less, in fact, what what what, what the kind of picture of, of self knowledge that 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 just suggests. So there is a, a couple of years ago, uh, I think to 2008, um, Eric. Schwitzgeber wrote a paper and philosophical review called uh, Against Nerve Introspection. And he says, well, everybody in philosophy, you know, even you, you, the, 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 the bad guys that like, I don't know, Dannett or even Churchill, and so even them, they, they, they seem not, not to uh, um, deny that, you know, self-consciousness, uh, that self-knowledge is special, that it's uh, privilege and so on. Uh, and, uh, but so I, so I, so I think there, Nietzsche may really be someone uh, who has a uh, uh, different view, um, and I think you know you have this idea, uh, um, uh, such ideas uh, which are really classic. So the first one is that uh, self consciousness is um, self knowledge is privileged, and uh, the second that is uh, 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 related that it is privileged because it is direct, uh, whether the knowledge we have of other minds is. is uh, indirect, okay. Um, so, but we have some kind of direct awareness of our mental states, of of our own, our own mental life, and that makes self knowledge uh, uh, privilege. Uh, so Nietzsche uh, denies that we have um, this kind of direct access, and the, uh, that, that and he, he, he takes self consciousness to uh, self knowledge also to be interpreted. So there is no basic no no, no difference. Uh, uh, in the way in which we uh, 
interpret ourselves and the way in which we interpret others, right? So we conceptualize our, our mental life and the same way in which we conceptualize uh, uh, the mental life of others. In our case, we just have, you know, sometimes more uh, um, experiences to, to draw on. You know, I, I, I feel my pain and I, and I don't feel the pain of another, but uh, in, in terms of self-knowledge, of self you know, of the way in which we are we articulate in a self-conscious uh, self, uh, way, um, so we apply this uh, basically uh, uh, the same kind of, of, of uh, uh, mind reading mind reading machinery. It's always uh, some kind of self human readings. Okay, um, and another point that he makes. So, uh, uh, but even if you say that, you still salvage the idea that uh, so, uh, uh, that the, the self uh, knowledge case is is privileged. You know simply because you have more, uh, for instance, uh, um, uh, more experiences to, to, to draw on. But, 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 but Nietzsche says that uh, self-knowledge is really a, a case of falsification because uh, the way in which we interpret ourselves is, is unreliable. Um, so we uh, use, I don't know, mental concept that are just something that we we pick up, let's say, from from the way the uh, the people around us talk, and and they they are not 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 really reliable uh, uh, to uh, describe, let's say, what what's going on in ourselves. So I, I I I so 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 that's the the main reason why I think it says that um, that um, self knowledge is really not not reliable it's not only be, be, because it is indirect but it's because it's based let's say on a in a, on a picture of of the mind on a folk psychology which is not really uh, suitable to uh, um capture what's really going on in us so i think that uh, um in a certain way i i i, I or, or at least when it comes to, to a certain key aspect of ourself uh, the values we have uh, the, uh, how valuable they are, in fact, are, and so on. Uh, but he thinks that that, that a, a first personal approach is um, preferable. So I, so I think something that that also Paulo um, defended in a, in a in a paper, and I I, I think it's a, it's a, it's more or less what what Nietzsche thinks, and maybe certain uh, uh, specific experiences like 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 illness, for instance, they can reveal important things about us. So that's kind of they they may be in a certain sense empathetic. Um, and uh, um, uh, something like, you know, a genealogical understanding of, of ourselves, of where our values come from and so on. So it, it helps us to understand better than just a, uh, uh, an exercise of naive introspection, so to speak. So that would is basically, yeah, what I, what I think here. Yeah. Um, Mattia, we have a question. Uh... Yeah, Tamara. Um, Tamara, if if I may, uh, just uh, since we are talking about um, self knowledge, a very brief question, Mattia. Yeah. Um, so first, first of all, let me say that I really, um, I, I really agree with Claire. It's it's an outstanding book. So uh, really, congratulations. Uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, reading your book. Uh, now the question. Um, so uh, as you point out in your chapter on on self knowledge. Nietzsche holds a, a very uh, quite skeptical and uh, phenomenalistic position or view about um, self-knowledge. But on the other hand, we know that, for instance, he, he praises the uh, French moralists as great masters of uh, psychological examination. Uh, and he um, also says that uh, the French moralists uh, achieve, were able to achieve some truth about the self. And he says more or less the same thing for uh, thinkers or writers like Stendhal, Dostoevsky, and himself. So um, how, how do you explain this, this kind of tension or paradox? Okay, so I, I, I think that when, when Nietzsche says that about the um, those people. So I think that what, what he has in mind is that, is that they are really very good uh, psychological observer in general, and that they could um, apply this kind of, um, of psychological um, 
So, and that could in, a, in some way of Aber also start to see themselves in this way. Uh, so the, I, th I think that's basically also what 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 Nietzsche thinks he's doing. Uh, and so he, I, I think he would put himself as in this in this group. So I, I and the the example of Dostoevsky, I think so. So Nietzsche thinks, well, Dostoevsky, the, you know, those ears in uh, Siberia, you know, he could really observe all those uh, uh, really interesting psychological types. You, you you know, the book he wrote is just uh, such a. Uh, deep investigation of how the human mind, you know, of, of types that are already uh, uh, um, really uh, not not the not the ordinary type, you know, criminals, uh, as as Nietzsche as, as, at least sell them, you know, how they uh, react in this kind of extreme condition, or uh, so. And and I I think you. What what he says about you, you, you know Dostoevsky could 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 really observe uh, um, a lot in how other people works uh, work, work psychologically. So it's uh, uh, when he says he's a great psychologist. I don't think that. Um, so I think the basic idea is that he could really understand how people in general, not 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 in particular himself, but how people in general work psychologically. And he could and and he maybe were able to see himself also. In this way, and stand out, you know, or this kind of uh, um, psychological observation about love. So I think there are now another example. And I think so. If you look at um, stand out, I think he, he, uh, this observation is also not based, let's say, on uh, let's say only observation of, of, uh, of um, real human beings, but also on studying, I don't know, uh, literature or a kind of. Uh, uh, Ethnological study or whatever. So I, I think, uh, um, in general, uh, um, a work of literature or an empirical uh, um, uh, study about the psychology, like, like let's say of a, of, a, of, a, of a certain tribe or whatever, uh, um, they could reveal uh, a certain aspect of human psych psychology. So, so, so that's why also Nietzsche got interested into this kind of ethnological uh, um, and more. Um, uh, let's say um, interdisciplinary works, you know, about I don't know uh, the, the 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 Chinese rites or, or or things like that, because they they uh, in, in search of of empirical observation about you know how the the, the human mind might might work in different in different uh, in different cases, and 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 I, th I think a realist of uh, I, th I think he says that in a uh, um, gay science, he says that you 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 have to become oh, uh, uh, über europäisch or außer europäisch or nicht europäisch or something like that. So the idea is that part of this exercise is to uh, uh, transcend, uh, let's say, the standard way we have of of seeing ourselves. And so maybe that, that that goes back to you, you know also to the issue of perspectivism. So how that helped you to understand better uh, uh, things in general, and in particular how we work as moral agent and so on. Uh, yeah, but I think. You can do that. I mean, and surely he thought that those people are were very talented in terms of you know simple psychological observation. But I think you know Stendhal also uh, has this kind of historical study of the of the of the different forms of love. I don't know in uh, uh, medieval Europe or 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 uh, 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 in in the in the in the culture of, of um, uh, Provence. Uh, 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 and so on. So I think this kind of historical um, or ethnographic uh, um, record that we find also in uh, in the literature um, that would be, for instance, the, the case of Dostoevsky is is uh, so they are in very important sources to to understand the the human mind. So you find there a record of of things that you wouldn't notice otherwise. So that's how we would. Explain. So I, I don't see there is there are some kind of contradictions. I think you, you can make make sense of this also in light of this kind of skepticism about conscious introspection. Uh, okay, I uh, would have something more to say, but we have three questions. Uh, so maybe uh, Tamara, Jason, and, and Fran, uh, you can ask the question all together. Then Mattia will answer them. So Tamara. 
Okay, good afternoon. Um, I, I have a very uh, short question. Um, I hope you can uh, clarify a little bit more your interpretation about the relation between um, rights and effects in the confirmation of morality and the relation, the relationship with perceptions on the mind. Okay, um, Jason. Yes, greetings from the Johns Hopkins uh, University campus. Maybe just another uh, quick question. I'm, I'm very intrigued by the discussion and look forward to uh, uh, reading the discussion of Nietzsche's naturalism, uh, particularly with the Hegelian perspective in mind as someone who works on both Hegel and Nietzsche. I find this um, rather confusing sometimes uh, that Hegel can be considered as allegedly some kind of uh, naturalist. So I just wanted to, to ask you to, to say more about the kind of naturalism that Nietzsche may then hold, um, how that's relevant to his uh, philosophical psychology. Brian left. Brian has uh, uh, distinguished between methodological, I think something like substantial naturalism in Nietzsche, uh, which uh, uh, does he then hold for you? And, and how does this uh, uh, fit together with uh, their views? Uh, okay, uh, Fran? Yes, thanks. Well, thank you for the, the conversation. It was nice. Um, I would like if you, Matia, can uh, say some words about the distinction that uh, Nietzsche used in Beyond Good and Evil about uh, premorality, morality, and uh, extra morality. Uh, he talks about uh, three peer periods of the humanity, and he used those words moral, homoral, and ausa moralisha, the period the Menschheit. And uh, I like if you can talk something about that. Um, in connection with this analyze that you use for the moral psychology about the drives and the effects, if you see some connection on, if you use some connection about this distinction that use Nietzsche in Beyond Good and Evil, or you don't take it. Thanks. Mathia? So I start with the first, um, and so I, 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 in fact, the first, the first two, two, two question, as I, I try to be quick. So the, the first one is, you know, say something more about the relation between drives and effects so, and, and, and morality. So that's basically, uh, so the, the short answer is, is what really Nietzsche says in this semiotic claim. So that, that, that um, in, a, in, a, in a way, in a, in a certain way, our uh, moral, uh, um, judgment so okay we, we can put things in this way so all, uh, our moral judgment or moral reaction uh, moral evaluation are based on our drives and uh, effects so what settle which kind of moral reaction we have uh, more judgment we we um we make our uh, the drive on effects we have in a specific kind of configuration of of, of course that's something that society will will shape in a certain way but in part depends on our individual psychology uh, um, uh, but that's basically the 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 idea. So the the, the role of perception. So I I, I uh, it's it's not really a crucial or or, or a central thing in in Nietzsche's view. I, I I so I think it, what he says about perception is indirectly relevant for uh, some other issues in his uh, philosophy of mind and and in in, in his broad view of of uh, psychology. Basically, I think that you, you perception are conscious uh, uh, in a way that's not really the way in which we are self-conscious uh, in the reflective sense so they are uh, um, and that and that they have a, a not uh, some a, a pictorial conceptual uh, a, a conceptual content that is pictorial uh, um, and so not language de dependent so that's the, 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 what I, I, I defend about perception in in the book but you you, you done really a, a find a major place for perception and as such, let's say, in, in Nietzsche's uh, um, discussions. 
So the second point that's the big, uh, Jesus says uh, is about na naturalism, right? In the, in um, um, so first of all, I think uh, so the 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 way in which uh, um, okay, let me put things in this way. Um, so there are many ways to to, intent, to 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 understand naturalism. So the most basic way is just just to say that uh, you know everything there is is uh, natural in the sense that it's there's nothing which is supernatural like gods or uh, spirits or uh, you know things like like those. Uh, in that sense, okay, we could say that maybe uh, you know many philosophers, including Hegel, they are uh, naturalists in this way, in this basic way. Uh, uh, but where, where is it? so I did I think a, a point is this um, uh, the, the, I think the the discussion in um, uh, uh, when we talk about Hegel and in a similar way uh, for instance when we talk about Wittgenstein and Wittgensteinians let's say in contemporary philosophy is about the role of normativity so and there is a certain uh, idea, you know, that normatively can be really naturalized. Okay, that uh, um, as as um, so to use the famous uh, formulation by by Sellers, you know, the space of reason isn't the space of causes. So there is no way to 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 reduce the space of reason to the space of causes or something like that. So I think that's basically something that Hegel accepts, right? So whatever form of naturalism he um, uh, we ascribe to Hegel is uh, is something that is uh, includes this uh, basic distinction between what is normative and what is causal. Okay, that's and 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 that's something that in contemporary philosophy, in fact, many people, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, many people identify as a, as an Hegelian idea. You know, Sellers does that, though he he, he he does that more explicitly with Kant. But but people like Brandom or McDowell, you know, are good uh, examples of this kind of. Uh, neo uh, neo Kantian Hegelianism or something like that. Uh, so you may call that a version of naturalism. Of course, I mean they don't aim to explain normativity by appeal to you know strange entities like gods or something like that. But they 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 keep the idea, you know, that uh, uh, the normativity of uh, claims um, isn't something that you you can really uh, make sense of in a purely causal, let's say, physical description of the world. So I think uh, uh, the, the, the question is, uh, uh, when it comes to Nietzsche, I mean, what, what, where do we place um, normativity? I don't think that there is such a clear um, cut in Nietzsche's. I don't think that Nietzsche thinks that values require something like a space of reason that is really uh, uh, a new kind of logical space or something like that, as Sellers would put it. Uh, so. Uh, 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 and the reason is because it thinks that values, at the end of the day, they are based on uh, our drives and effects. Uh, so they don't depend on uh, uh, um, on the kind of things that um, Hegel or Kant or or, or Wittgenstein think uh, uh, think are um, you know the heart of normativity. So that's the the the. the uh, would be my my answer to, to this point about naturalism. So I think it's it's a way to see where I think uh, there is a, a a substantial difference between whatever form of normativity you may ascribe to Hegel and whatever form of normativity you may ascribe to uh, uh, Nietzsche. So I think that uh, in the in the Hegel uh, uh, in the Hegel uh, case, you have something like a second nature. Aristotelianism, so, so, something that you find in contemporary philosophy, for instance, in in, in McDowell, maybe, or, or or in this vicinity, uh, or maybe Brandom. So I don't I don't know Brandom very well. Um, okay, the last point. Um, so I I hope I remember exactly what Nietzsche says in that aphorism. But uh, so as if if I'm right, you know, he says, well, pre morality is some kind of uh, um, pre historical or something like that stage where um, so, so we we judge the the value of a certain action just by looking at what happens at the uh, uh, consequences of an action. So some kind of very rude, primitive uh, uh, consequentialism that doesn't really look to psychological uh, um, 
things like intention or or something like 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 that. Then the the moral uh, period is where we start to see uh, the value of an action, not really in what happens in the consequences, but in the in the um, intention of of the agent. The extra uh, moral would be, you know, when we. Uh, I don't think it's a, it's going back, you know, to the premoral where uh, we just look at the consequences of an action. Um, uh, uh, what it exactly is, it's it's it's. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about, it, but I think it's just um, uh, it just uh, it surely it, it no longer is uh, a, 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 a you know just looking at the intention to uh, find if a, if, a, if an action if an action is valuable or not. Maybe just see the action as. Uh, um, the way in which the action is related to the agent in a more holistic way or something like that, maybe something to, or uh, looking at the kind of values that the action reveals, you know, the, the, the kind of act, values that the agent uh, embodies and that the action then reveals. I don't, I don't, I don't know exactly. I, I don't re remember so good the, 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 the end of the half of I should look it again, but uh, um, so I think that the switch, I mean, could be uh, uh, so in. Uh, uh, so it's curiously, it's, not, you, you, it's so maybe you could map that uh, into certain stages in the in the, in the story that that Nietzsche tells in the genealogy. Boy, it's it's not clear to me how we, how you could do that, but surely, I mean, it could it would tell some kind of story about how how you move from one to the other, and that that would be some kind of change in the. Uh, human psychology involving um, maybe uh, the uh, evolution of, of new cognitive capacities. You, you know, as he says in the, in the you know, as uh, in the second thing, the genealogy. You know, you have the um, uh, revolution of the ca ca capacity to remember as a presupposition of uh, uh, the capacity to to, to, to make uh, a promise, for instance. So maybe something like that. You know, some kind of co cognitive evolution is also involved there. Uh, um, uh, surely a new, a uh, different way of conceptualizing uh, a, a different psychological framework to make sense of, of what people do. So that would be my, my answer here. Um, many thanks, Mattia. That makes a little bit more than two hours. So I think we can conclude the session. Um, if you have more questions, I guess you can send an email to Mattia. Um, I just want to thank Mattia, Claire and Helmut and uh, of course all of you. And um, well, I wish you a good uh, evening and uh, all the best of course to uh, Mattia's book. And that's all. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much again for organizing it, Paolo. And thank you to Claire and Helmut for the very helpful comments. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.